Get ready for a whole new experience at this year's Festival of Homiletics in person and online, May 16 to 20. Join us in Denver, Colorado, or online from wherever you are. This year's theme is After the Storm, Preaching and Trauma, and it will feature Otis Moss III, Nadia Boltz Weber, Anna Carter Florence, and Raphael Warnock. This year, the festival will draw up to 1,200 colleagues in person and thousands more online for preaching, worship, and dialogue to help you develop a hands-on way to engage trauma in your own ministry context. Other speakers will include William Barber II, Lauren Winner, Robert Wright, Yolanda Pierce, and many more. Make plans for this incredible learning experience with top teachers. Join us in Denver or online. Register by February 15 to receive an early bird discount. Go to www.festivalofhomiletics.com for registration and details. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Ralph Jacobson. The text for the second Sunday after the Epiphany on January 16th, 2022, are Isaiah 62, 1 through 5, Psalm 36, 5 through 10, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11, and John 2, 1 through 11. Our, uh, our friend and dean and podcasting partner, Joy Moore, continues to be taking a bit of a, a short break from podcasting. That happens when you're a dean. Uh, and we should note, too, this is also uh, Martin Luther King Jr. weekend, and so a lot of churches are um, making note of that in their, in their worship services on Sunday in one way, shape, or form. Big texts, so, big, big ideas. Yeah. The thing you want to say on, why don't we start with Caroline on John 2? <laughs> Why, thank you for that, that <laughs> introduction. It's called, a, it's called a segue. Segue. How is that? Yes, that's a very nice segue. I would be Seamless. delighted to share a few words on John 2. Please. So we have this little interlude, of course, into John 2, and then the rest of Epiphany is from Luke. So, uh, so I'm very conscious of that, that we're only having this one little dabble into John. And so then to take seriously its role as an epiphany text, as an epiphanous text. And of course it is first, there are the obvious things is Jesus' first miracle, Jesus' first sign. And, and you get in verse 11, revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. So you have these, these and this is the beginning of his ministry. Uh, it is his mother who basically says to him, it's time, it's time for you to move out of the basement and I'm tired of buying pizza and beer for all your friends. This is really is the moment. This is the hour. And, uh, and this, yeah, this gets his, uh, his ministry get started. I want to take us back to the verses just previous to this in John 150, where that might be an epiphany theme, if you will is that where Jesus says uh, in, in John 150, you will see greater things than these. And, and that's really what epiphany is about, is uh, these greater things than these that keep, that keep getting revealed in terms of who Jesus is and why Jesus is here. And, uh, and of course, in, uh, in, chapter two, it's this, this great sign of water into wine. But as we know, the signs always point to, uh, what do they point to? They point to the fact that God is revealing God's self in Jesus. And what exactly is God revealing about God's self here? I think that's the first thing that pre the preacher has to ask. And, and, and because that's the glory. And the glory here is that God is, God is revealing God is revealing God's whole self. We were talking about this before with the gospel of John, the, 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 the it, God becoming flesh is this absolute fullness of God into humanity. And that, that is seen as, that is seen as glory. And, uh, and so these, these greater things then are, uh, we've been talking about this with epiphany, but these greater things are, 
who Jesus is. We were talking about who we are, how we are transformed, but don't forget also that this is a revelation of who God is, manifestation of God's presence and God's activity and, and, and what God, uh, what God is about. So that's my first and it's a, Yeah. It's a, you know, and what's so refreshing is it's a manifestation, not of, not of awe. If we're not, not seeing like stones being broken and, and storms coming in, like in some of the Psalms, we're not seeing threatening tones of judgment here. It's a wedding. And as well as all of the abundance are there's themes in here of surprise and there's themes of delight. Mm -hmm. I think at least that's what I hear when the steward comes to the bridegroom and says, everyone does it this way, but you've done it that way. I don't think he's saying you dummy. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, oh, no. like, you don't know how to, you don't know how to trick your guests at a wedding. I think it's, it's this kind of delight and just, this is wild. We've never thought of doing it this way before, or what a, what a, del what a delightful move. And of course the bridegroom doesn't know what's going on, but you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's more than just, um, yeah, it's more than just a story about how great God is. It's also about when God gets revealed, sometimes the response is laughter and joy and hilarity and astonishment. Yeah. And I think too, it, there's a, a subterranean narrative device here, if you will, of how the story or the events of the story or, or the plot of the story that, that what gets revealed is not always immediate. Of course, that's going to be, that's going to be part of the whole gospel of John, but, and, and what you see is not always what you get, thus the misunderstanding, but, you know, that's the narrative lectionary continuing on in John and, and uh, we're moving into Luke, but I think it's important for this text to say that, you know, that you save the best wine for last is a kind of indication that, that these greater things than these or the, you know, the full glory of God, you think you see it, but, but things have yet to be. And so I think this is element of surprise and delight, but also uh, a, a kind of hope and a kind of a push, always a pushing forward to, to wonder and to ask and to move through epiphany of what's, what is God going to do next? What is God going to reveal next? And, uh, and so I think there's some of that uh, theme as well in this text. I want to bring out a couple other aspects of it too uh, that uh, um, I've been thinking about with this text recently. One is that um, it is his mother who is never called Mary in this gospel, but it's his mother who says, you know, do something about this. And he says, my hour is not yet come. And of course the hour is the hour of glory, which is the crucifixion. And so by Mary pushing him out there, as it were, she is pushing him out there into that thing, which will lead to his death. And so what this costs her to be the one who initiates this, I think is uh, really an important aspect of the characterization, the characterization of Jesus' mother in this. This is not, um, this costs her a lot. So um, yeah. to me, and to me, that changes the story. And it also is a reminder, uh, particularly in John, which could be in really, which is a really interesting epiphany theme as well, is that the fact that she's present here and then in, in the first, the first epiphany of his glory, but at the same time reminded that he had a mother. And so this is a major theme in the gospel of John that, Every time you want to make Jesus fully divine, the, the, the John reminds you, oh no, <laughs> Jesus was fully human as well. You're holding both of those things together constantly. And, and maybe that's another thing to be reminded of in Epiphany that sometimes Epiphany or manifestations of glory, uh, we, we, look for, we look for only the divine. We look for the, the glorious, the, you know, the, the, the miraculous in, in, in how God reveals God's self. And yet God, God is also revealing God's self in, in the flesh. And are, is that a, a different kind of hermeneutic to move through uh, epiphany as well? And of course, as you know, 
the only other time the mother of Jesus appears, reinforcing your your observation, Rolf, is at the foot of the cross. And so that that bracketing of Jesus ministry of of Jesus mother is a, a is a reminder of his humanity and uh, and a reminder of, as you said, the cost of this, of the pain of what does it mean uh, for Jesus to become for God to become flesh? I've heard I have heard in my life two absolutely um, riveting sermons on this text. One was at a friend's wedding, and the preacher's move was this. You, this, he, speaking to the couple, this is the kind of God you have. A God who, once he starts to doing something wonderful for you, doesn't know when to stop. Providing you not with, not, providing the wedding party not with just enough wine for one toast, which is at a lot of churches, congregations, uh, in our pietist tradition, that allow any wine or champagne, it's like one toast, but enough to fill six 30 gallon vats, enough wine to get everybody in serious trouble. And uh, that was, and the other, I was what Matt, I don't, I don't know if you remember when Don Jewell preached on this sermon, uh, when we were both uh, out at Princeton in the, in the, in the chapel there, uh, uh, although it might've been when they were meeting in the basement as the chapel was being redone, he got up and he told the story about, I mean, you know, in Mark, the first miracle is something useful, you know, casting out a demon, you know, rescuing somebody from possession here. There's nothing useful about this. And, um, and then he, then he told uh, a story about an old alcoholic that he had been the pastor of who, um, he just talked about how this old guy had looked forward to his planned binges. Uh, he, you know, he was a conductor on the railway. So he would take two weeks and he'd be working and not have a sip. And then he looked forward to the thrill. And afterwards, um, one of the uh, pietist professors came up to Don and said, wow, do you think there's something wrong with my tradition that we don't know what to do with this story? <laughs> I, I just thought that was fantastic. Mm. Well, and uh, I don't know if you both know this, but I've been to Cana and, uh, and that, you know, that so much wine was produced that you can still buy it. Like you can still buy bottles of the wine from the wedding. I have one. Yeah. That's pretty remarkable. But my point in that is <laughs> uh, my point in that is that, that, that what you're talking about, Rolf, uh, and, is another way to think about, I mean, if, if, if we were continuing on in John and I was going to have a, uh, uh, a talk and it, if I was, if we were continuing on in John in epiphany and if, if I was going to create an epiphany theme, uh, for, for John, it would be epiphany is grace upon grace. And that's, that's what we, that, that this is a, this is a manifestation of what grace, abundant grace, a grace upon grace looks like, knowing that grace never occurs after the prologue. And so what does, again, so it could help people think about what is epiphanies as moments of grace uh, and that, that grace is not something that we have, but grace is what, you know, grace is, grace is what God does. And, and grace can be as, as simple and as glorious as God manifesting, revealing something about God's self or even being present, that that is a, that is an act of grace on God's part. And it's some pretty, uh, very, very, as, uh, our friend Ben pointed out, that's some well-aged wine right there. <laughs> yeah, in contrast to Isaiah 25, which where it talks about the, the eschatological moment when God shows up, it's going to be like a feast with well-aged wine. And here, here is that eschatological moment. Yeah, yeah, right. I like it that sometimes a miracle doesn't have to be a healing or a deliverance. Sometimes maybe it's just God giving us joy in a moment, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that you remember forever. Isaiah 62. Again, we've got another one of these, uh, another one of these passages talking about Jerusalem, talking about and is the marriage, city. Is this the connection? So, say it again. Is this the connection, the marriage where a young man marries a young woman, wedding at Cana? 
Yeah. You're Just asking. Me. You're killing me, Smalls. <laughs> the, the, uh, yeah. I try not to think about it sometimes. I just want to yeah. take the text as it is. Take the text um, as it is. Keep well, going. that's where I got the word delight as well. I mean, there's this mm, idea, you know, yeah. the Lord delights in you. Mm-hmm. That's just as powerful as that text from last week where, where God says, I love you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, especially, um, I mean, I think that this, this will play with people from almost any age demographic, but especially uh, for younger ones, when it says, um, you shall no longer be called forsaken. Your land shall no longer be called desolate. I mean, which is bad nicknames. Um, I don't know if you've ever you were given bad nicknames uh, as a child. That That is bullies assign you a nickname, a name that you don't like. And then everybody realizes you don't like it. And so that's all they call you for four years. Uh, in some way, That's what they're saying is, you know, your name has been forsaken and now you shall be called my delight is in her. The her, again, the city, because cities are feminine in um, Semitic languages and and your land married. Yeah, that is to have your name changed from forsaken one to my delight is in her, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and I think. If you've ever then had a name you like, or someone calls you, you know, a name that you like, that that sort of transformation I think is uh, available to anyone. Yeah, I mean, I think it speaks. It speaks to transformation. It also speaks to maybe somebody having their their true self seen and brought out as well. I think yeah, about naming ceremonies and churches, um, people in the trans community who have have taken what could be a legal thing and, and, and made it a kind of religious, um, it's the word I want, there's a liturgical element to it, right, of being known and, and having one's you know, true self being uh, recognized and declared before God and acknowledged before God. I've only had one nickname in my entire life, and that was Carrie, K-A-R-I. My friend Sarah Sanford called me Carrie. She was the only one ever. Well, you just put it on a podcast, so get ready for... Yeah. No, you've had other nicknames, Caroline. That's not true. Like what? Geography Maven. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm that saying? That is true. Yeah, that is true. You're right. Geography There's other Maven. nicknames. Sometimes I get called Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> there's... Uh... There's something in this text too that that's that's noteworthy. I think of the opening lines, you know, for Zion's sake, I won't keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I won't rest. I mean, to think about what does it mean to be so provoked that one will not rest or take comfort for the sake of something else or for the sake of a larger cause uh, or of somebody. I mean, I think that would resonate well with the King holiday uh, this weekend and 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 talking about that kind of passion. Um, to wait God out, right? I'm going to wait for these promises uh, because I know God has made promises to Zion and to Jerusalem or to other mm-hmm. groups. And to think about the role of the voice here, because this is not, it's not God speaking, correct? I didn't look up the larger context here in Isaiah 61, but it's the, it's the prophet saying this. And this is what the Lord's going to do for the Lord delights in you. This is this is an advocate speaking on uh, to Jerusalem on behalf of Jerusalem and, and what's the right word, not implicating God, but like basically calling God into, this is what God's going to do for you. Yeah. I, I don't think you can distinguish most of the time between the prophet's voice and God's voice. This, this is one that continues the whole spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has, you know, anointed me. And so the prophet is speaking in the spirit um, here and, um, but the, inter- you know, I can't remember, uh, was it recently in our podcast that this one line, uh, that we were talking about would have been maybe a couple months ago about, um, upon your walls, I have posted sentinels all day, night, they shall that never was, be silent. You who remind the Lord. Yeah. That was, us, was right? us about two months ago, I think. Month and yeah. Half. So, um, sounds different now than in whatever advent or whatever that was, um, these texts and podcasts seem to run together after a while. Don't know if you've noticed that after 10 years. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes. Good. Uh, the Psalm. Psalm 36, five through 10. I mean, there's a way in which the Psalm summarizes much of what we've already talked about in terms of what does God's steadfast love look like? Uh, that the persistence, the vindication, uh, and the description of 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 God's of God's righteousness, uh, and what what pro, what provision looks like in terms of you know God entering into a wedding and 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 uh, and the abundance uh, that that unfolds. Uh, here we have some descriptions of what that abundance looks like and tastes like and. <laughs> which is uh, which is the beauty of this section of the psalm. You know, the, the part of this psalm, uh, f- first of all, you know, a lot of psalms are, are pretty raw or straightforward, and then others get uh, more poetic. And I think this is the second kind that uh, where the poetry is a lot more dominant um, than just sort of the... Uh, the rawness. And so God's, God's qualities of steadfastness and faithfulness and righteousness here are seen, are, are, are poetically portrayed as, first of all, extending um, to the mountains, excuse me, to the heavens, and then being like the mountains. And I've got a friend, uh, Steve Thomason, who uh, is coming out with a book on visual preaching and working preacher books soon, actually, uh, that could do a lot with this. So that, I mean, notice heaven, that that steadfast love and faithfulness extend to the heavens, righteousness, like the mighty mountains, judgments, like the deep. I mean, these are all the, you know, sort of the big, um, these huge vistas and that God's, God's qualities are portrayed in a very, not anthropocentric, but whatever create creation centric view. Um, and then I, I've always loved this line um, with you as the fountain of life in your light, we see light. And I don't exactly know what to make of it, but in your light, we see light. I think that's been an important verse for me, especially since I first read Douglas John Hall's light in our darkness uh, in a previous millennium. So with First Corinthians, we've got uh, the first of six consecutive six. Sundays. Oh man, that's awesome! Working through the uh, the latter chapters of this great letter, chapters twelve through fifteen. And this is a great place to settle in uh, on on Epiphany because we've talked about about manifestation, and mm-hmm. here it is: the manifestation of the Spirit given to each person, but so that you might, so that the church might uh, reflect that to the wider world. We talked in previous weeks about. Um, helping a congregation understand all the ways in which they preach to the world. And these gifts are part of that. Yeah. And of course, Paul has referred to this back in uh, chapter seven. Uh, I wish that all were as myself am, but each has a particular gift from God, one having one kind, another having a different kind. And here, here we get that, uh, that spelled out. And I, I think the, yeah, that these that the way in which we think of our gifts as manifestations of of our epiphanous <laughs> manifestations, but um, particularly the, the verse seven really really struck me. Uh, the translation here, which I assume is NRC, to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. And uh, another way that can be translated is uh, uh, to be better or to bring together or to be helpful or or advantageous. And um, that's a direction that I would go with this text is that these gifts are not, uh, you know, and that's a point of Paul, actually, that these gifts are not uh, to, to secure your status in a community. But to, but to make the community, to be advantageous for the community, to make the community better, to, uh, to bring it together. And that, uh, that, these, that walking through epiphany is not just having your own little you know, epiphany moments, but, uh, but a, perhaps even a realization a revelation about yourself as to how is it that, you, what, that, that 
what God has seen in you and what God acknowledges in you is, uh, is really necessary for the bringing together of the body of Christ. That's really, uh, it, it, that is, um, that is the, to the betterment, right. Of, of the people around you. And I think maybe some people need to hear that these days. I go back to, I go back to one seven, uh, first Corinthians one seven, uh, when I run up to this, where Paul in his greeting says, um, I know you've been enriched in him in speech and knowledge so that you are not lacking any spiritual gift. Speaking to the community, the community as a whole is not. And so being enriched in speech and knowledge, Paul's going to talk about that shortly here uh, soon, a little bit here, but then it's some in First Corinthians 13. The community can only not be lacking in any spiritual gift if everyone in the community recognizes everybody else's spiritual gifts is necessary because the Corinthian community was being split in some ways by spiritual gifts. Apparently some were like my spiritual gifts better than yours. I have, I don't know. I'm, I'm given the spiritual gift of sarcasm, which is more important than your spiritual gift of sincerity, which I think we'd all agree, but I still need your sincerity. <laughs> 